Yes, so maybe I take it back from uh, the definition to move uh, again to uh, what I was saying in the last few minutes, right? So, um, indeed, this is the definition of uh, marriage migration, but we need to reflect about the opportunities that this such a definition can give to us, the fact that we can focus on marriage migration rather than thinking of um, general migrations and therefore on certain aspects that I tried to mention throughout uh, the uh, presentation before. On the other hand, it can be uh, problematic because, of course, yes, it's dominated by women, but how shall we include also men? Uh, do they migrate for marriage? Are they invisible within this literature? Yes, they are quite invisible. Uh, and also the other point is this uh, migration, we tend to categorize migrants precisely because we need to uh, give them certain rights. That's the main, main, main reason whenever uh, they enter a society, they enter the receiving the new society. So they lose certain rights, they access new rights uh, depending on where they move to and fro. Uh, therefore, uh, I understand this definition as Mother entry is family reunification, therefore the rights I will be entitled as marriage migrants are related to my marriage, to the fact that I marry a citizen of that country, but uh, not to a work contract. However, my daily life might be also shaped by work and marriage, mm -hmm. production and reproduction. Uh, therefore, again, um, we need to be a bit more flexible. There is more fluidity in the life of a migrant, uh, if we compare it to the legal aspect, uh, the, the legal way we frame them within our societies. So that is the a working definition. Uh, I mentioned how marriage migration is useful or could be a creative, a very an important uh, concept, uh, not just as a phenomenon, but also important to uh, look at this uh, connection between uh, broader politics, life of uh, social changes or society, uh, and uh, intimacy, the intimate life of uh, a migrant. And then I was making a point about marriage migration because there is a uh, emerging literature, it's a quite uh, significant literature on uh, marriage uh, migration, contemporary marriage migration. But we don't have to forget that marriage migration is not something uh, new, it's actually very common, uh, a very common practice, especially within uh, uh, patriarchal societies. And I would like to make the point, do not think that patriarchal societies, uh, I mean, this is not actually just related to Asian societies. I easily apply it to the case of Italy a few generations ago. So uh, again, uh, it's more the patriarchal uh, concept rather than the geographical concept shaping uh, marriage migration. So, uh, and there are three main principles we might want to consider uh, shaping traditional marriage and for the movement of women, mainly women, from their home, from their family, to the uh, home and family of their husbands. First of all is the concept of exogamy, the fact that uh, it was uh, accustomed to marry outside of uh, a community, patrilocality, when uh, uh, therefore this principle that uh, the new family, the newborn family should be located or reside near the husband's parents or even within the husband family. And then also hypergamy. So especially these two are particularly important and we should look at them in a transnational context, that of cross-border marriages, right? So hypergamy, the way, uh, I mean the fact that marriage was seen and is still very often seen as a way to achieve upward social mobility, to marry up. And this especially, let's think about traditional societies, women used not to uh, work, at least not within, uh, yeah, not to work and therefore the only way for them to uh, uh, achieve social mobility was very often by marrying a man uh, um, who 
had uh, a better economic situation of family, marrying in a family with a better economic situation. So again, marriage was seen or is seen in traditional societies, in traditional thinking, for a woman as a way to uh, achieve upward mobility. So what is the difference, though, between traditional principles and contemporary uh, societies? Because actually there is a kind of, uh, these traditional principles are applied also in contemporary marriage migration, uh, with of course some uh, other important details that we might want to take into consideration, precisely because we are in a globalized society, uh, so there's plenty of uh, cross-border migration, global migrations. So, first of all, and again here, the uh, idea uh, of this uh, dominant uh, female um, phenomenon is also related to, um, so it's not just a matter of traditions, but we also have to take into consideration feminization of migration, uh, a concept that uh, is applied especially to contemporary uh, global migrations to refer to uh, an increasing presence of women in, uh, in migration patterns. And generally, there is this tendency to see um, an increasing presence of women from developing countries in developed countries. Um, and this remind us to reflect or to consider the global hierarchies of power and this fact that the fact that uh, contemporary global migrations occur within these uh, uh, these patterns. Um, therefore, within this um, feminization of migration, so more women moving for labor as well as uh, for family. Movements that are not anymore from one village to the other, but eventually they are uh, international movement, cross-board movements, whenever we think about marriage migration. And this uh, eventually has been uh, conceptualized in different ways whenever we think about, uh, in particular, um, movement for, uh, movements for marriage. So, for example, uh, Parenas talk about, talks about international division of reproductive labor. Uh, she is suggesting on uh, this, uh, she's not just referring to uh, potential marriage migration, but also to domestic work. And anyway, the way contemporary societies are organizing uh, across border, are organizing that uh, everyday um, reproductive and productive uh, management uh, th uh, across borders. But there is also another term that has been used uh, quite extensively, which is global care chain. Uh, therefore, uh, shedding light on these uh, transnational networks and connections at the level of people here in this case, series of personal links between people across the globe based on the unpaid or paid work for caring. You might be wondering, why do you bring this caring issue within marriage migration? It might be more related to uh, domestic workers. But actually, again, this link between, in some cases, marriage migration and care is uh, very tight to the point that, and here is uh, the point developed by Lan, uh, uh, mate or madam, meaning like certain poorer family not able to uh, access or pay for a, a maid very often uh, marry a migrant from Southeast Asian country, from a developing country, in order to have that service within the family. So again, the, the line is blurry. And I'm not hinting that, I'm not trying to say that marriage migration, we need just to think about poor women from poor countries used or exploited. No, it goes beyond this. Very often we have smart women, educated women, uh, marrying 
for love, other times there are other kind of logics. So the line keeps on being blurry. The line, the, the, the whole dynamics are very uh, complex. Another important point that is related to marriage migration is that of reversed geographies of power. Uh, meaning that uh, here there is plenty of literature exploring how uh, these marriage migrants come in from um, Develop, often developing or poorer countries eventually go to richer countries, more developed countries, uh, but eventually that experience is actually, uh, I mean, they don't get, get social mobility within the develop, the, in the receiving country. So they eventually end up on, on, with marrying down rather than marrying up. They often marry with poorer men within developed countries, but poorer men entering into situations that are not, uh, so they might have certain opportunities related to the opportunities given by the developed countries, economic opportunities. On the other hand, from the personal perspective, family perspective, there might be a, a worsening of that situation. Um, and uh, of course, here, this is explicative uh, of uh, this uh, second point, the fact that marriage migration is seen as a strategy for men and family in disadvantageous marriages to form households, but uh, for reproduc reproduction as well as for care. Um, and the idea of internationalization of householding that is closely related to the international division of reproductive labor or the global care chain, chain also suggests this fact that at the moment for these families it is not anymore sufficient to think about one nation, one country. We need to think about uh, not just the cross-border movement but therefore it might also bring in different uh, social economic systems that are uh, dead by these migrants, as well as legal systems, rights, and so on. So the, 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 there is a complexity of experiences that make uh, marriage migration, traditional marriage migration, uh, something even more um, complicated and um, uh, both for the individuals who experience uh, or who are involved, engage in marriage migration, as well as when we study marriage migration. It's not sufficient to think about patriarchy, gender, and so on. We need to think about this transnational, uh, cross-border perspective. So the old principles are women move to the husband families. There is a patriarchal order that organizes their life within the family uh, and societies through gendered identities. Uh, and of course, membership to the husband family. In, with regard to new trends, we have to keep these uh, elements in mind, but see how they intersect with this internationalization of life. The fact that it's not anymore a matter of reproductive life, very often we have productive and reproductive life in the life of, indeed, of these migrants. Uh, whenever we think about productive, most probably at this stage, we are talking about paid work. Or, um, and it's not anymore a matter of being a member of husband's family, most probably it will become being a member of the husband's nation, because here we have the citizenship uh, issue, therefore uh, intervention, intervention of states much more than in traditional uh, marriage patterns. And now, what I want to think and reflect on is actually the question we made at the beginning, right? What is marriage migration? But how, what are the forms? How does it eventually uh, occur in everyday life? And we mentioned about two cases that are definitely part of marriage migration, false marriage as well as forced uh, marriage. But actually, uh, marriage migration includes a rather different set of uh, um, forms. So uh, I don't know if you are aware of the mail order brides, 
which was a phenomenon quite common, I think, between the 80s and 90s, between Asian women and uh, American, uh, in particular American men. Um, therefore, uh, catalogs with the picture of these women and men uh, being able to select the, um, the, the women they preferred. And of course, there was an exchange also uh, via uh, mail, uh, letters and so on, and eventually uh, marriage. Uh, trade marriages or arranged marriages, very common in uh, Asia, but not only. Uh, and within these trade marriages, the brokerage industry becomes step into and becomes an important um, actor. Brokerage industry that actually uh, could, uh, I mean, brokers could be marriage migrants themselves, other women, so we don't have to look at this just in exploitative terms, but most probably also as forms of negoci negotiation and strategies of um, survival for these, uh, for these migrants. Brokers that were legalized or are still legalized in certain countries, I think that it was the broker, um, these marriage agencies have been um, um, for profit, have been uh, um, made illegal or are not possible anymore in Taiwan since 2006, so it's a quite recent thing. And this is also closely related to traditions. There was, it was part of traditions um, um, to have arranged marriages, to have an intermediate uh, organizing and deciding who uh, should be married with whom. We can also think of marriages of convenience that are slightly different from arranged marriages or trade marriages. Uh, in this case, we have two members agreeing to, to individuals agreeing on getting married. And before, when I was mentioning about those uh, earlier marriages with veterans, right, from the Guomindang in the late 80s, early, throughout all the 90s, uh, most of those were marriages of convenience, um, meaning that the, for the woman the, in China, there was an opportunity to go to Taiwan and work and most often support their family back in China where very often we are talking about poor contexts. On the other hand, the husband had a wife and someone who look after her, especially when he will become older. So this was like very often I've been told by my informant, we were fine, we agreed on that, that I will look after him, but I can go to Taiwan, it's the only way for me to go to Taiwan and uh, be able to have a work, earn money, and support my family back in China. Um, I also, whenever we think about marriage migration, <laughs> a lot is related to diaspora and the connection that diasporic groups, I'm a bit outside of the case of Taiwan, I'm just taking a very general uh, picture, right? The case uh, uh, that several diasporic groups, even here in Europe, there are uh, the Turkish community in Germany tends to marry, uh, to find wives very often back uh, in uh, Turkey. Uh, so this again is related to connection with homeland and in some way preservation of culture, uh, ethnicity within the diasporic group. Um, love marriages and <laughs> so many of the people I interviewed so either they married because they liked that person, maybe for different, uh, uh, how do they call it, tiao jian, uh, with different, uh, what is the tiao jian in? Conditions. Conditions, yes. Uh, in, uh, uh, from what I might choose, but still uh, that was their, their way to, to frame marriage. Um, um, and very often, this is what I think is important, Many marriages of convenience, eventually they became an, a relation of affection between two individuals who had a sense of responsibility towards each other. So again, this, there is a tendency to demonize marriage migration, but it's much more normal than what we think. It's much, more clo it's much closer to everyday 
life, our, even our everyday life, than what we think. There are also cases, and here uh, this, the line between these two is actually blurry, between uh, trade marriages, arranged marriages, and trafficking of women. Trafficking of women is not what I, uh, I, I really never managed to uh, talk or explore this uh, aspect. Again, the line is blurry, the, li the line between this level and all the others is blurry, but of course I think that trafficking of women eventually has to be dealt with different tools, sensibility, and uh, also most probably concepts. Okay, so this is just uh, uh, a, a way, a slide to share with you the uh, the heterogeneity, whenever we think about marriage migration, again, the image we might eventually have uh, in mind uh, should, it, it, most probably in rea reality, uh, what really happens is much more diverse than what, uh, how we tend to frame or think of it. Okay. Uh, good. So this is a general introduction about marriage migration, uh, the concept the, the phenomenon. So, do you have any questions so far? Anything that wasn't clear or no? Good, because I'm passing, I'm moving, it's, that's no problem. I mean, this is a very general uh, introduction. I am moving now to the case of Asia, even though I already mentioned a few aspects and features about Asia. But I want to go a narrow down, and eventually we move to the case of Taiwan, right? Sorry, I have a question. Yeah. Um, how about people who migrate for love, or whatever reason, but they don't, do they have to get married to have a status in Taiwan? Mm -hmm. Can you move in with someone without being married and obtain the residence permit that allows you to stay for longer? The answer is most probably, uh, the easy answer is no. Uh, therefore, marriage migration, so it's connected to what we were talking about before. Uh, it's very hard to be a long-term resident in Taiwan without a reason. Uh, I need to be there and have a, a study visa, uh, a working visa. So I always depend on something else. As soon as my study ends, I need to leave the country. I can be a tourist, okay? for three months if uh, there are certain agreements between countries. So marriage becomes a way uh, to uh, live uh, on a long term permanently in Taiwan for, um, inter for international um, citizens and so on. With the case of China, is even more complicated. I will explain later there are two different sets of laws depending on where you're from. Uh, if uh, you are in Taiwan, regulating your uh, duties and rights in the country. Uh, if you are Chinese, until 1987, there were no exchanges between Taiwan and, Chi and China, so mm, it's very hard to go to Taiwan. After 1987, there have been some changes in the 2000s, but actually, the only way for a Chinese, one of the, uh, the few ways for a Chinese individual from one from the PRC, People's Republic of China, to go to Taiwan was through marriage, because they couldn't even go there for 10 days, mm -hmm. okay? Unless, okay, there are some exceptions uh, related to, um, if you have a relative, a close relative, uh, for funerals, but still related to your uh, relatives, um, or sport and educational uh, events, and since uh, to, I forgot that date, it should be 2009, um, there is the opportunity for, uh, so wait, one thing is uh, group tourists from China have the right to go to Taiwan, but on a group tour, so you have uh, specific uh, steps, I mean, place to visit. And then later on, they opened up the opportunity to go to Taiwan with a tourist visa for citizens from certain 
cities or provinces in China, Fujian, Xiamen, uh, should be also Beijing, Shanghai, so the main uh, city, so depending on your Hukou, which means that a big majority of Chinese people, they still uh, find it hard to go to Taiwan. Uh, at the moment, we also have student exchanges between China and Taiwan for more students, uh, press, uh, Chinese students in uh, Taiwanese universities, so this is also another option that is more recent as well as business uh, and trade, but again, these are very limited uh, categories of people uh, who can uh, really go to Taiwan. So, especially, uh, we need to think about China and Taiwan. Uh, um, I would say that if Taiwan has not changed a lot in the last three or four decades, uh, let's say at least two decades, two or three decades, China has changed uh, extensively throughout the last three decades. It was a very poor country and eventually is uh, a world power. Uh, economically, socially, it has gone through fast, quick, significant changes, which means that all these changes also impact <laughs> the will to go to Taiwan. Do many Chinese still people, women, still want to go to Taiwan to find opportunities. Actually, most Taiwanese people go to China to find economic opportunities because Taiwan is, uh, at the moment, not doing very well economically in terms of uh, economic development, work opportunities, and so on. So actually, at the moment, all this uh, marriage migration, uh, especially in the last, since the, the highest peak is in 2003, it then gradually decreased, it's quite stable now, but has not anymore the same rate as early 2000s. So in the last 10 years, marriage migration from mainland China has changed a lot, not only diminished, but we also see really who has interest to go to Taiwan. When I was in China, many women told me, uh, Taiwan was fine 20 years ago, uh, now it's fine to go there for food but not for life opportunities. I have everything I want here in China. Why should I go to Taiwan? And I will show it to you in a few minutes, especially considering the hardships that I will eventually have there as a Chinese citizen. So yes, there are still women who want to marry to Taiwan to find opportunities so because there might be some ways, that they might think in certain ways. Uh, many women, more and more, marry also because they again love and so on so eventually for various reasons they decide to have a family because of husband work or because of husband family uh, health issues the mom is uh, old father is old. these kind of things actually really shape the way these cross trade couples eventually live so yes it is uh, very difficult to uh, to go to Taiwan without a marriage if you are from China. But less and less people want to go to Taiwan for marriage. So we need to take this into consideration. And I think the most important thing is to look at how really social changes, actually the changes of China shape uh, these social and economic changes in China shape these uh, trends. Thanks for the question. Any other questions? Good, so I would move to the case of um, more general in Asia. It's just a few points that reiterate in some way uh, what we've already touched upon, and then I will move to the case of Taiwan, okay? So, uh, here we have some, uh, I, you can't see it really well, but anyway, <laughs> there are some trends related to marriage migration in Asia. So why so important? Because actually, especially for certain countries, marriage migration in the last 10, 15 years has been an important phenomenon with an impact in these receiving societies. And so on the one hand, there's a clear, even though changing precisely because of those uh, sorry, uh, global hierarchies or regional hierarchies of power that have been changing, um, division 
between sending and uh, receiving countries. So on the receiving hand, and we have in particular Singapore, Taiwan, and South Korea. Japan is still one of those countries. So here, uh, I can't see anything with my eyes now. The top. Uh, 39. International, that's the percentage of international marriages. Ah, yes, and this is the ethnic, um, the, the Marriage different different ethnic groups. Sorry, I'm without glasses, I can't see properly. <laughs> but anyway, uh, let's focus on this part in particular. And we can see that actually uh, in uh, certain years, the peak for Taiwan is, as I said, in 2003, with 32 of all nation, oh, sorry, 32 of all the marriages of 32% of all the marriages of that year, 2003, are with a non-Taiwanese citizen. Okay, 60% of those were with a citizen from mainland China. But Singapore is doing also quite well because in 2008, the percentage is 39%. The other one following is uh, South Korea. Taiwan, as you see, has dropped down uh, gradually after the, that 32% and is now at around 8, 9% in 2010 it was 13%. Uh, the case of South Korea is also quite significant, uh, about 14, 10% more recently. Um, the case of Japan, Japan is still quite close down to international marriage, even though we can talk later, is also an interesting case uh, with great involvement of local uh, governments shaping these marriages. Uh, and on the other hand, we have those countries which are actually in uh, East Asia, oops, yeah, Southeast Asia and East Asia, the mainly, uh, the greater the sending countries with regard to marriage migration. Uh, Philippines in particular to South Korea. Uh, but definitely uh, Vietnam and China and Indonesia, actually China, Vietnam, Indonesia, if we want to see it in order, with regard to Taiwan, are the main sending countries. And you see they have a very low income of uh, marriage migration. Even though I have to make a point, actually, the case of China, I don't really know the percentage, the correct percentage, but there's been a great increase of internal marriage, sorry, uh, 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 incoming, um, incoming, yes, marriage migration. Uh, China, there's an increase, the experiencing the same social and economic changes of Taiwan and uh, other already developed countries, economically developed countries. Uh, therefore, uh, decrease of fertility rate, less women willing to marry, uh, availability of men, unmarried men, and therefore the need to find these migrants. It's still a concept of universal marriage because more or less everyone should be married within in China. There's a lot of pressure to get married. And therefore, uh, China, um, there are many wives uh, from uh, in the borderlands, from uh, Korea, from uh, Vietnam, but also again, arranged marriages also with other countries, uh, Indonesia and so on. <coughs> so, uh, this table is simply to uh, identify those main sending and receiving countries within these marriage migration trends in Asia. Uh, so, whenever we think about marriage migration in Asia, indeed, we tend to see recurring uh, aspects this clear division between sending and receiving countries, the fact that we have indeed mediated marriages through uh, brokers, marriage brokers, um, that is still quite part of uh, um, traditions and is broadly accepted uh, in society. This gender ratio, again, is important with a great dominance of marriage migration related to women, but we're talking like about 95, 96% uh, of all marriage migrants. Um, again, women coming from lower income countries or social groups, 
whereas men are often from wealthier countries and therefore are those receiving uh, societies, Singapore, Taiwan, South Korea. Um, not always these men are uh, in a good economic position, especially, I would say, throughout the 90s and uh, 2000s. Uh, and especially in early migration, the age gap within the couple is quite, uh, is quite big. Uh, and another detail is, yes, we might think about groups uh, from different nationality, but on the other hand, very often we have same ethnicity. So again, marriage migration between China and Taiwan is same ethnicity, even though arguably whatever nationality is uh, something uh, uh, that is arguable in this case. Um, but this is also reproduced in the case of Singapore, where most of these marriages actually occur between uh, the uh, same uh, ethnic, uh, ethnic groups. Uh, of course, at the base of everything, we saw before we have those patriarchal traditions <coughs> that are reproduced in contemporary times, we also, along with this, we have globalization, liberalization of borders, and therefore the possibility and opportunity to move cheaply, quickly, and often across borders, and therefore find uh, new opportunities beyond the, in this case, marriage market of uh, the country where uh, an individual lives. And this is uh, based uh, a bit on the literature, a bit on my own, uh, the, 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 the data I gathered when I was uh, uh, doing research with uh, marriage migrants um, in Taiwan. Uh, because uh, on the one hand, we have those uh, broader social, economic aspects. On the other hand, we have uh, those uh, elements, the perspective of individuals. And uh, I wanted to also mention personal motivations because eventually this slide resonates with the one I was uh, I shared before about the different kind of um, different forms of marriage migration, right? So in the case of women, very often the reasons that are shared is like yes, I married. In this case, in my case, was to Taiwan. But some of the literature is also the, some of the data I gathered for this slide is also. Uh, coming from uh, other literature. So uh, economic reasons, betterment, I wanted to improve my life opportunities. Uh, family project, meaning that uh, we, I, I, th there was this person, he was living in uh, Taiwan, eventually I uh, followed him to create a family. So this might also be uh, related to love, but the reason also to marry abroad sometimes is also, especially in China, because a woman passed the marriage, um, marriage age, and therefore she wasn't available anymore in the marriage market in, uh, in China. And therefore, again, searching for resources or opportunities uh, beyond. Uh, important or crucial is uh, uh, the story of other migrants. When they are successful, or at least they are told, <laughs> they are uh, shared, with a successful narrative, then um, migrants, many migrants telling me, this and this friend had a good uh, experience, maybe they introduced to me this other person and eventually decided to marry with them. <coughs> uh, sense of responsibility towards the spouse, in Kia uh, is related to what I was mentioning before, this, uh, uh, the fact that um, eventually some marriages of arranged marriages some marriages of convenience, eventually they become also, uh, they, they become something more. There is affection or at least a sense of responsibility. Uh, and of course, what we were mentioning before, a fluid change from other forms of migration, sometimes internal migrations, especially if I think about the case of China, women who move, that's great mobility, women who move from rural areas eventually uh, to, uh, main cities in Shenzhen or Shanghai and so on, eventually they met someone and decided to uh, marry uh, a Taiwanese person they met maybe on the process and eventually they moved to Taiwan. In the case of husbands, 
very often why do you decide to marry someone uh, from uh, a different country uh, as we said before especially veterans they had this difficulty to find a wife in the local marriage market could be ma uh, veterans could be any low educated not too rich men therefore these are uh, those who are less competitive in the marriage market and therefore they might eventually have to rely on different uh, sources um, advertisement by brokering agencies is also something especially when for example in Taiwan when it was legalized you have really advertisement about uh, Mary um, a woman from Indonesia they are subservient sub they are uh, kind they cook for you these kind of uh, ideas are sold by brokerage uh, uh, agencies uh, the again this is actually shared the fact that you see a successful uh, marriage amongst your friends and therefore you uh, get you also decide to get involved in this kind of um, experience again family project we decided to create a family and therefore uh, eventually we married uh, of course this point ensuring care for old age is what I was mentioning before and this connection with marriages of convenience and especially when I was doing interviews I was like why did you marry that woman she was beautiful I've been told this as well so again uh, um, this quite uh, common and shared experience between these uh, men and um, uh, and women. So, sorry. So, you don't have perceptions of men in Taiwan, for instance, as being kind uh, for uh, Chinese women. So, for instance, Chinese women, like Taiwanese men, would say she was beautiful, so I married her. Uh, would Chinese women say uh, he seemed kind? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And civilized and whatever and modern. Yes. And so I wanted to marry him rather than the Chinese. For uh, it's their own perception. I'm not saying that this is yes, how sure. it is, but yeah, uh, actually, you made a good point, and I didn't mention it here. Definitely, especially so. I see it. The kind uh, one woman I remember telling me, I will never marry a Chinese uh, man. They are too rough. I don't remember what she said. I uh, feel closer to Taiwanese. So there is also a sense of perception on the on the side of women. Um, or more progressive or more, I don't know. Um, the progressive open minded, uh, because eventually, what happens in the cross uh, whenever we compare China and Taiwan, mm -hmm. actually, the more conservative is Taiwan okay. in terms of traditions, whereas China is much more open. Mm -hmm. So, they never mentioned. He is very open minded. Actually, they are more traditional than Chinese men. I'm generalizing here because uh, women actually make differences also amongst different men within China if they come from the south, from the north, and so on. Uh, but uh, progressive is definitely more modern, more progressive, more uh, open. Uh, it's not uh, an adjective that was used to describe Taiwanese men. They are often described as. Uh, traditional in their thinking, uh, attached to family, to a big family. So one of the challenges of these uh, mainland spouses, in particular, when they go to Taiwan, is the fact that they is like uh, they say it's like jumping back uh, 100 years, <laughs> because we still in Taiwan there are still these very uh, strong family, uh, religious traditions related to Chinese. Uh, traditional culture so but this could be a reason I mean the cultural difference whatever it is could be a reason why this is attractive to women to move to Taiwan because some women might be looking for something more traditional than crazy yeah in China so. yeah there's some uh, there are plenty of reasons sometimes cultural difference was appreciated the fact that they are softer and kinder, this is the terms that they were used to describe Taiwanese men. Uh, 
Um, I forgot I wanted to say something, but anyway, it was a little detail. Uh, definitely, uh, the perception of how the uh, the other, both on the side of men and women, uh, behave, uh, the, their thinking, and so on, is uh, something that was mentioned uh, in uh, uh, as a reason to uh, why you married that person. And because sometimes I ask, why did you marry that person? Why did you marry in Taiwan? That's the other question I ask. And very often, some women also mentioned, I was curious, there was no other way to go to Taiwan, and I decided to get married, which for me was like a very brave <laughs> choice, but that in some cases, that was uh, the ideal of freedom uh, that is embedded in Taiwan, Especially again, let's not think about China nowadays, that has changed a lot, so it's very hard to still talk with this uh, narrative about China. But definitely until the 2000s, that were, that were the, some of the reasons that led these women to marry to Taiwan. Yes? Just, just one remark. On the women's side, I, I see love. I don't see love in the, in the men's side. <laughs> because they don't mention it too much. <laughs> that's, that's, you're right. Uh, they didn't mention too much this word. No, no, yeah, that's very true. shy. Yeah. Maybe it's just shy, maybe it's just the, of no importance, but I don't know. I think it's more a matter of, um, uh, first of all, a generation. Yeah. So uh, older people might have a different perception of what is marriage and they do not always associate it to uh, love. Uh, a matter of gender, so the way you talk about your marriage uh, might be slightly different if you are a woman. And it's also a matter of my gender, so the way they related to me, the way they talk to me as a woman. Uh, so I think this also had an impact that it has to be taken into consideration. Yeah, but very uh, not often, even though in some cases, I would argue, especially younger men, they really, I remember this man telling me uh, that it was a risk to get married with this mainland spouse, but they really loved each other, they've been uh, divided, uh, they've been apart for so long because they couldn't, uh, again, sh the only way to meet was in China, so he visited her in China, he couldn't stand it anymore, they decided to marry, he loved her. Uh, but I think he was quite exceptional in the way he uh, expressed mm -hmm. his love, and uh, the, yeah, the way really he expressed and narrated his love towards his wife. But I don't think it's that there is not this aspect, I think it's more a matter of, yeah, 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 but it's a good point. <laughs> Any other points? I think I have one more uh, slide on Asians. I go back again, sorry, I'm jumping from one thing to the other, but uh, simply, I'm going back to implications, so I go, uh, again, I, I just want to touch upon a few important um, aspects whenever we think about marriage migration. And we need, in order to reflect on this, we need to go back again to this, right? To, the, to such a big percentages, percentage of cross-border international marriages for these countries, which means that the presence of these migrants eventually have an impact, have some implications. It's not anymore just a marriage, I mean, a couple thing. It's a social uh, and eventually political, we will talk about it uh, issue later. Uh, so implications are quite significant, for example, for Singapore and Taiwan, where there is a high rate of international marriage. So let's reflect, but these are just a few points. We might also want to be uh, to, to, to discuss and think about other points, but uh, definitely for receiving states and societies. So these marriages tend not to solve, but at least to contribute to increase the fertility rate, because very often they have a few children rather than just one. Uh, so this is a plus for receiving states. Eventually they can't really not rely on these migrants in some way. On the other hand, tension, opposition, contradictions, population quality. This is a term, term that has been often used in Taiwan, but it's not only in Taiwan. In China too. In China as well, yes. 
So what I mean, what is the impact on the quality of population if these migrants from poorer countries or from mainland China, so also a little bit of this political aspect, come in mass in our, um, in our, uh, in, in our countries. So it's not just a matter of changing the demographic ratio within the country. The questions are how will these women educate our children, the future generation, will they be able to speak proper Chinese to teach them the right culture to these children? So these are the questions that are asked actually. And these are all under this expression, population quality. So the cultural habits, think about uh, in particular Vietnamese, Indonesian women with different cultural habits, integrated and expected to assimilate into Taiwanese uh, society. So these two, in particular, population qualities closely related to all those projects on integration, trust, acceptance of these uh, migrants, right? Integration into society, trust towards them and their ability to uh, raise a new generation of uh, children. Uh, acceptance of, the, of their different identities, habits, cultural habits, and so on. And very often, these assimilationist policies towards these uh, migrants. And it's not just a matter of sending states. Actually, most of the literature is inside here. But there's a lot going on also with rela rela in relation to sending state, states, something that, or societies, something that has not been uh, covered or extensively covered by the literature. There is something going on, but not much. So on the one hand, the question we might want to ask is how these migrants contributed to the development of the sending uh, countries, especially, again, 80s and 90s, if I think about cross-strait marriage migration. They went to Taiwan to earn money. They looked after their family members in Taiwan. They sent money back to China. This is part of economic development of China, eventually. Their children, very often some of these women were divorced, had children in China, they couldn't take them in Taiwan. Their children could study. They went to university, they went abroad, thanks to the money sent by their moms. This is completely invisible. No one talk about this. Not just in the literature, the literature starts to cover it, but even at the, at the level of government, right? Uh, is there acknowledgement and recognition of the contribution of these migrants? Not very much, especially within sending societies. Uh, instead, there is some debate with regard to the left behind family members, which is actually part, if I think about China, is part of a broader uh, narrative on left behind children and elders. And this also connects with the case of those children that have been left behind by these marriage migrants, their parents who is looking after them and so on. So uh, these are a series of concerns that uh, are related to sending states. Sorry, so, so you mean, for instance, the, uh, the Chinese woman migrating through marriage to Taiwan would have had children yeah. before that marriage? So uh, again, it's not younger generations, those who married in the last, uh, most probably, 10, uh, yeah, 10, 15 years, but those who married earlier, uh, so we said they married with veterans, some were much, uh, were very young, but actually many were divorced. So divorced, which means uh, on the one hand marriage, it was a way, marriage, marrying abroad was a way to get rid of this stigma of being a divorced woman in the village. On the other way was one of the few ways to support uh, the children uh, from previous marriage in uh, China. So I go abroad, I earn money. You, you say children? Yeah. But there is a one-child policy, one-child family policy. How the one-child policy children? applies to only a small part of China. Uh, the majority, there are a few who had a few children, maybe two, but actually a majority had one child. So it's simply children in general, uh, <coughs> many women, many children, but it's, uh, the majority, if had children, had one. I had a couple who had two children, which is really like a few cases. So yes, 
uh, not all of them had children, eh? but uh, those who uh, um, divorced uh, and used marriage to Taiwan as a way to improve, to, to, to sort out, to deal with these issues of poverty and looking after the family, um, they left behind their children, their child. And um, um, who were raised either in uh, by relatives, uh, and this is a this is another bunch of experiences that have been left quite neglected. So that need to be researched. To be honest, there is some research, but not very much. And some were sent to board board schools. Um, boarding school. Boarding school, yeah. Um, and moms could afford boarding school precisely because they could work in Taiwan. Mm. Yes. And uh, again, implications, so broader implications, and of course, uh, <coughs> in the life of uh, an individual. Mm. I actually. Um, uh, didn't include uh, family because there are also implications at the family level. Uh, with regard to marriage migrants, there is this uh, narrative as well as experience between being a victim or having agency within this uh, decision to migrate and uh, eventually to uh, be in control of uh, their life. This uh, opposition Con con contrast between opportunities. I go to Taiwan because, uh, for example, um, there are opportunities there, but restrictions, restrictions that are related to the legal limitations I will be talking about in a few minutes. Uh, and of course, another implication is that eventually they have to manage a life between two countries and two families, and there is uh, there's a bunch of uh, complications in uh, the life of these individuals, especially if we think about earlier marriages, when it could take days to move from, at least one or two days to move from one town in uh, remote, remote town in China to uh, Taipei, or even, but the, here we are going down to different layers, it took two days sometimes for certain migrants to reach Jinmen, which is a small island offshore of Taiwan, it's just in front of Xiamen. And nowadays exchanges between China and Taiwan are um, developed, there are plenty of flights and so on, but in those years actually she had, and there are also direct exchanges between this island and Xiamen. But at that stage, there were no direct exchanges between Xiamen and the island, so she had to do really a whole circle up to uh, from a remote place in China, da down to Hong Kong, up to Taiwan, and then again a flight to go to the island. So again, all these are uh, complexities in the life of these migrants, even though uh, now everything has been uh, simplified through direct flight connections. Yeah. Um. I want to come back to the fertility rate. Yes. Uh, there are some statistics, I uh, don't know in Mofa, that says uh, something like 20 to 50 million women are missing through uh, abortion, etc. So there is a skewed uh, population distribution. And so, in fact, um, women should be more respected and uh, not uh, left to go abroad because of lack of women in China itself. Uh, can you detect that or are there any studies that uh, uh, put some meaning to, to this uh, idea because it seems it's very easy if somebody comes in China, oh this woman's okay, take uh, and she can go abroad whereas the situation should be so dire according to this kind of abortion statistic that they would not let her go. I comp that's a good point. And actually, um, I would say that uh, they don't frame it in this way. If I, I, I don't know at the level of uh, um, state level, right? But I don't think that the Chinese government can do anything with regard to limiting 
this uh, immigration to Taiwan. Actually, China, is, if we think about China, Taiwan has all interest that Chinese people go and live in Taiwan and set the, they, they become permanent citizens there. They maybe they influence the uh, way Taiwanese think of themselves and think of China, right? So, uh, in general, I would say that uh, we can talk more in the detail later, but in general, the state, Chinese state, is that doesn't even look at this as a international migration, is internal migration for, the, for Beijing, right? With regard to people, um, actually, uh, there is this tension between uh, at least three points. One is uh, economic opportunities, especially uh, until 10, 15 years ago. So the fact that this migrant can help the whole family uh, economically. Um, the fact that this, mig this woman in the family, most probably the single child, uh, will, uh, if it's older women, they have brothers and sisters, to be honest. But anyway, this uh, woman in the family will uh, go to Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan is still a remote place. We don't know too much about Taiwan. We know that it's very conservative. So do you really want to go <laughs> there? So rather than being, and uh, yes, sorry, the other point though, that is the point that shape eventually the final decision is that very often I've been told by my uh, informants, that was my choice. If I wanted to go, they, they, they actually, they were not happy. They didn't want me, but that's my final choice. So I do what I want. And therefore I also will be responsible for my choice later on. So there is not much narrative about the fact that you, because there are, uh, less women in China, so we need to keep the, uh, you here, then it's better you, that you don't leave. The narrative is not in this way. Uh, um, yeah, did I answer your question? Especially at the level of people. So, so there's no trace of that uh, skewed no. distribution among uh, girls and boys that has an influence on the policy city. or decision taking uh, to go abroad or not? Uh, in terms of everyday life, no. In terms of policies, not as far as I know. And above all, in terms of policies with regard to China and Taiwan, the Chinese Beijing has very little interest to limit the marriage between Chinese and Taiwanese. The interest of Beijing is that there are many of these marriages, because they are proof that there is one nation, uh, that we are, sorry, one nation. So I uh, think uh, it's not a proof that, the, that we are one nation, but it's uh, um, a, a way to favor exchanges between these two societies and therefore to emphasize or stress uh, this idea of uh, unification and unity across the Taiwan Strait. So there are no limitations. Most of the limitations are actually on the side of Taiwan. Even though there is, uh, of course, I mean, uh, in uh, China, the, no, but the limitation is in Taiwan because as soon as you marry, you have the right to, you are entitled to go to Taiwan. But that, that's a good point on the Chinese side. If you get married to a foreigner, not a Taiwanese, mm. let's say. Um, if you give less social, less, less points uh, in the social credits to women who marry to ah, foreigners, yeah, that is, uh, or if you give more points yeah. to these women getting married to Taiwanese, then you can impact actually. Yes. On uh, the choices of marriages, it's too early to say. Yes. Because the social credit is very new, but. If I were the Chinese government, I would do something like that to encourage women to stay in China somehow and give them more opportunities to travel or whatever if they get married to a Chinese man. So I could influence the demography of China. So, yeah, can I also say that 
uh, we need to look at all this. Uh, I uh, now I notice that I now I notice I know uh, I look at it from the perspective of Taiwan, right? Thirty yeah. percent for China is like little <laughs> nuts. Yeah. So it doesn't have a big impact. Uh, therefore, it has always been neglected. And more recently, one of my arguments is that it is more in political interest rather than demographic. And it's not just cross-strain marriage, also international marriage. It's very low, the outflow of migration from China, even though China is still, for those countries, ascending country. So it's crucial for receiving societies. For sending societies, for, for China itself, is a very small percentage. So most probably it's not so significant. Yeah. Okay. Yes? Um, you said in the beginning of the, the class that uh, Taiwan has like different policy for marriage or places like with China, with other countries. Yeah. Uh, but you say on the other side that uh, the Chinese women could be regarded as propaganda from the party, from people who like uh, ignore like the, the idea of one China, the idea of um, um, like raising the children in a way they can like suggest them that China and Taiwan should be living in the same country. Um, but the thing I was thinking is that it's, it's quite recent. It's quite recent right, that the China used the opportunity of the state to use the women in that case yeah. because I guess that's when China was like a developed countries and not it was a developing countries and not developed. It was not um, a weapon they could use to show on the world like. Mm -hmm. the importance they could be, they could hire. And so you, you said that uh, like Taiwan used usually the restriction against China, but China has no interest to use the restrictions. But is China, uh, has China any associations, any structure that can use for women in Taiwan, Chinese women in Taiwan, like for example, I don't know, an association, an association of women, uh, Chinese women in Taiwan, they can use like to link so Taiwan and China without saying it's two different countries, saying it's one country, but just linking to other parts of like maybe Macau or Hong Kong or something. And yeah. the question is that is that is this recent? I mean, just or it has only been used since 1987 yeah. in the first place. So your question is a very good. One is actually the answer will come. Uh, if you don't mind, because otherwise I, I won't bear it. No, no, it's wonderful. The, the, I'm happy you actually asked the question. And it's uh, uh, a way to introduce what I will be talking about uh, in the last uh, session, right? Uh, when you ask, so if I don't manage to answer you with what I have in the next slides, you tell me, Lara, please uh, sort out these points. With regard to time frame, it's definitely a very recent thing. Uh, informally emerged since 2004, but becoming stronger and stronger after 2008. And actually, the climax is between 2008 and 2016. Can you guess why, if you know national politics in Taiwan? Yes. The, during this period, the government in power is the KMT, Guomindan, therefore, the, as we said before, the go up, the go, a government that is slightly friendlier towards China, therefore is more open to any kind of exchange, uh, negotiation, therefore China also had more space of action in Taiwan, okay? I'll be talking about this, I don't want to say too much now, I'll be talking, uh, referring to these points later, and if uh, is, uh, I'm not answering to your question, you just let me know, okay? Any other questions? I think, uh, yes, eventually, even though most of the examples I used so far uh, Shall we have, a, uh, let me think about time. What time is it? You have half an hour, so I guess we can just go on. I just have half an hour? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, out of three? Yeah. Oh my god! <laughs> See, I told you, this is really 
going fast, time is flying. Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so would you mind if there is no break and I just uh, go through this more. fast? <laughs> uh, there was a documentary movie I also wanted to show you. I will show you in just a few minutes then. So marriage migration in Taiwan. We already actually said uh, a few things with regard to this. Uh, and here there are some pictures I took during field work, but let's move directly to the statistic. Statistics that, as I said before, uh, we have... Um, um, so, even from the statistics, we see that there is a division between uh, uh, Waipei, so foreign spouses, and uh, da Lu, Xiangang, and I think also Macau spouses. Uh, in my case, I want to focus on those coming. not here. It's here. Those coming from uh, uh, mainland China, da Lu, right? So <coughs> the fact that statistically there is this division between Southeast Asia, sorry, uh, foreign spouses and uh, China, uh, those coming from China, from mainland China, suggests us some other kind of division, which is legal right legal in the sense that we have two different systems two different laws that one the international law or immigration act that um, regulate rights and uh, duties of all international migrants and then the act governing relations of people living across the Taiwan Strait and this is related to any citizen coming from China and living in Taiwan. So, and this, of course, uh, reflects those uh, relations between China and Taiwan and the fact that citizens from China cannot regard it in Taiwan. The Taiwanese they want, don't want to regard them as Taiwanese citizens, but in the meantime, for these issues between China and Taiwan, they can't also be regarded as uh, international citizens. So, the solution, let's introduce a different uh, document. So, uh, and as I said, the phenomenon started uh, in, in the 1980s, whenever we think about international marriages, late 1980s, whenever we think about cross-trade marriages, and uh, as we see at the moment, this is last year, uh, there are 530,000 uh, marriage uh, migrants, 176,000 from in, uh, other countries, whereas from China, uh, 353. Uh, okay, so there is a great prevalence and dominance of migrants from Taiwan, so from mainland China. Uh, I wanted to share with you uh, actually a success story. Uh, from uh, this is actually not coming from China. This is a migrant coming from Taiwan, uh, from Vietnam, who uh, married uh, a Taiwanese, actually in this case a Taiwanese scholar, and she became also quite famous, um, a quite famous uh, filmmaker, documentary filmmaker in uh, in Taiwan. So I originally I wanted to share with you uh, an uh, out marriage is one of the movies she made that was nominated for the best documentary prize at the Taipei Film Festival. So, um, and again, it's simply to show you how uh, these uh, migration experiences might start as uh, victims and eventually move to uh, the individual being in charge of their life. Uh, I skip this part. Uh, and I move to the case again of cross-strait marriage migration, but is everything interlinked? Um, because I want to explore how eventually these individuals who uh, married to Taiwan for this bunch of reasons we mentioned, uh, improve their life, uh, have a family or personal uh, plan, project, and so on. Eventually, as a consequence or in relation to the way they've been treated in Taiwan, the, 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 the difficulties they have to face over there, eventually they become political subjects. Um, 
and this is an important, it's not one picture, it's three pictures that are related to the same, uh, to the same context, uh, uh, which is a protest. Uh, this was done in 2010, uh, and uh, actually this is not the only, there, there are several protests organized by marriage migrants in general, cross-strait marriage migrants in particular, and this is related by cross, to cross-strait marriage migrants. And this is a list of the requests that were asked to the government uh, with regard to the legal treatment they are uh, to the legal treatment uh, for cross-trade marriage migrants that is indeed regarded as unfair to the point that even scholars mentioned these marriage migrants are not second-class citizens, they are even third-class uh, citizens. And it's precisely because we have these two different set of laws, immigration law and cross-trade uh, act, that there is a differentiate, differentiated treatment treatment, legal treatment with regard to cross uh, straight uh, marriage migrants. So discrimination in this ca case, and I'm going through the legal treatment in a few uh, seconds, is related on uh, the, uh, the one hand, similar to other uh, international marriage migrants, those coming from Southeast Asian countries, related to the fact that they are associated to poorer countries, therefore uh, seen as inferior, but in the case of China, that poorer country is also the enemy of uh, Taiwan. Therefore, they become political enemies within Taiwan, not just racialized subjects, but also politicized subjects. This uh, um, slide is summarizing um, the main uh, improvements, but also the non-improvements, uh, the styles with regard to the legal treatment related to cross-trade marriage migrants. If you see, I divided two main uh, blocks, uh, 2000 to 2008, when there is the DPP uh, in, uh, in power, and then 2008, 20, 2016, when the KMT was in power, so a friendlier approach towards marriage migrants. So, I just mentioned the more, most important points. One which is still in the process is the process to obtain naturalization is actually a big issue with regard to cross-trade marriage migration because it was raised to eight years, the whole process from uh, uh, family reunion to uh, naturalization indeed. Uh, uh, decreased to six years in 2009, but there is still big dissatisfaction with regard to these six years because Southeast Asian migrants, international migrants, if they want to obtain Taiwanese citizenship, if they want to be naturalized, the process will require only four years, which means uh, here we are discriminating on the basis of nationality. Uh, another important point is uh, uh, related to the right of work. This was sorted out, sold. There was no right to work for the first six years uh, during this until 2008, but then it was uh, with uh, KMT, it was sorted out. Um, we are still uh, on uh, a general situation in which a uh, citizen from China cannot freely enter Taiwan, which means that these women very often married a man without even seeing where he lived. So the first time they could enter Taiwan was only after marriage. This is also one of those issues that have been raised by civil uh, society, something that doesn't happen with regard to uh, international, uh, international migrants. I also want to, I just keep these points, and I move to the right to work in public office and uh, to vote. Actually, okay, uh, forget vote is wrong. The right to work in public office, because the right to vote is uh, uh, available as soon as a migrant become a Taiwanese citizen. So between uh, this case, uh, after uh, eight years and now after six years. But uh, this, which makes, uh, so um, a cross-trade marriage migrant after six years is entitled, if she goes through the whole steps, is entitled to become, to, to be naturalized, to become a Taiwanese citizen, and therefore she has the right to vote. On the other hand, there is not the right to work in public office until 10 years after naturalization. 
this is definitely a discrimination against a Taiwanese citizen because of their previous nationality. Uh, so the question I might want to ask is uh, why do you think there are these and these uh, limitations and why the government doesn't want to be, we are talking about a democratic Taiwan, this was at the beginning what we said, so if it is so democratic and with so much pressure on the side of civil society, why they don't want to really give up on these two main points, with regard to mainland spouses only, not with regard to international uh, citizens. Because it's forced the women to stay like in the family of the, uh, the husband and so have like the culture and the political ID and stop her like for influencing the child for at least 10 years. Yeah. Like More than the child, even the whole society, or even the political system of Taiwan, right? Um, the, the democracy in Taiwan. Because what happens is that there is, uh, uh, um, I mean, uh, will to delay as much as possible their naturalization because in this way we will delay as much as possible their impact whenever they will vote, right? And of course, right to work in public office because uh, it's a sensitive area, political very often, and there is no interest, at least for the first 10 years, that these uh, migrants might interfere with Taiwan uh, politics or sensitive information and uh, so on. So it is clear that this group is politicized in Taiwan. They are not just uh, wives, they are not just uh, moms, but they eventually are, ev the, the way they are perceived indeed is uh, the enemies of uh, the nation. So they are seen as an enemy from within. There's plenty of literature exploring how they Oh, sorry, this, uh, I have a different one. Uh, and I want to provide some statistics and just move at this uh, part to understand why they are so significant in terms of voting rights. So uh, on the basis of uh, statistics, right, uh, those who are elig eligible to vote in Taiwan are those who acquired Taiwanese uh, citizenship. At the moment, uh, sorry, this is million, not thousand. This is the eligible uh, voters in uh, Taiwan. Foreign spouses cover up, foreign, including Southeast Asian and Chinese, cover up to 1.33% of the whole uh, eligible voters in terms of numbers. Uh, therefore, they start to become a political force in Taiwan. They are more and more aware about that, and uh, indeed, um, that was the main concern of the government. That's the reason they are not very happy to provide them, uh, give them to decrease the, the time to obtain uh, naturalization. Uh, so, there's plenty of literature covering the, um, the politicization, this, the, exploring this aspect with regard to cross-trade marriage minors. Isabel Chen described them as enemy with, from within. Uh, there's the fear that they would compromise Taiwan de facto independence vis-a-vis -vis China through their voting rights. Most probably they will be supportive of the uh, KMT, but still um, uh, to the point that um, there is this system of graduated uh, citizenship that is precisely for cross-trade marriage migrants that provides especially political rights. So civil and social rights are uh, allowed, um, are entitled, uh, are offered as soon as you become a Taiwanese citizen, but is graduated with regard to political rights because, uh, again, there is no trust towards this. Uh, migrants. Even though he, when we look at civil society organizations, so another way to see how they are politicized, actually there is a kind of isolation with regard to, to, to groups. Uh, there are some related to foreign spouses, international marriage migrants, and a few related to cross-trade marriage migrants. Uh, they have uh, done, organized some protests together, but Again, different needs, different interests, therefore very often they have uh, separate actions, besides the fact that 
um, isolation is also on the side of Taiwanese uh, feminists and women's group who are not very willing to get involved with these migrants coming from China. Again, their national identity, their political identity become uh, a, a way to uh, shape their opportunities also within civil society organizations. Um, so what is their reaction to all this? I'm sure that no one of them imagined I would go to Taiwan, I marry a Taiwanese man, and then eventually I become a political actor in Taiwan. But actually, this is what has been happening uh, more recently. Uh, so, uh, I mentioned before, and I'm not going into the detail, there have been protests, so I would frame this within informal political actions. But what has been happening precisely after 2008 is formal political uh, participation. How? First of all, as supporters and volunteers for uh, the KMT in electoral campaign, definitely they wouldn't support the DPP, not only for the stance towards China, but also because all those restrictions, I mean, if they had any benefit, they got it from the KMT, not from the DPP. And whenever there are restrictions on their freedom and so on, is often implemented by the DPP. So there is this, uh, uh, definitely this polarization. What happened since 2010, we even have mainland spouses who established political parties. So again, this is quite uh, we can argue uh, against or in favor of this, but this is what has been happening lately. Candidates in local elections, to the point that she was elected, I forgot her name, uh, Shushui. Shushui. Yeah. Yeah. Shushui. Yeah. 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 Yes. Uh, she was elected as representative of the uh, local council in Nanto district uh, with. Um, uh, last a couple of weeks ago with, during local elections and also and here is uh, on the other side they are perceived and they also promote themselves as bri bridges across the Taiwan Strait often building up on a narrative that is developed instead by Beijing okay so uh, after, in particular, after 2008, there's uh, a bunch of political opportunities that these migrants eventually embraced and took on board. Uh, and that could be understood as part of national politics in Taiwan, cross-trade politics, but I also in some way argue that these are also related to the evolution of the phenomenon and the fact that we have women who have been in Taiwan at least 18 years, right? Because we have those eight or six years plus 10 years. Nothing would have been possible 10 years ago of this, okay? So there, is, there are political issues on one hand. On the other hand, the fact that they are allowed, they, 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 at the moment they are entitled to take political action. Uh, so, let me see. So the interesting features with regard to cross-trade marriage migrants, we can see them as well uh, with uh, international Southeast Asian marriage migrants, but definitely uh, there is a different drive between, uh, behind uh, motivating their actions and also uh, shaping their, uh, their actions. So uh, why is all this interesting? Because first of all, okay, uh, there's an emerging uh, literature on migrant political participation, not only in Asia, but I would say uh, even in Europe. Even in uh, Paris. In yes. A scholar working on the Chinese political yes. participation. Yeah. So this is becoming more and more significant. Uh, of course, this also relates, intersects with women political participation. But again, marriage migration so far has been analyzed, explored in terms of family, life experiences, impact on society. Politics has been something that uh, is quite neglected. But really, this phenomenon in Taiwan is giving us all the tools, all the cases to reflect on this connection between family, personal life, and politics. So 
Uh, it is also important to think in terms of transnational politics. So we were uh, reflecting before about transnational life, transnational couple life, transnational intimacies, but in this case also the fact that there is a politics of in between, and it's very clear with cross-strait marriage migrants, the fact that migrants interact with mainstream political parties um, uh, in the receiving society through their links, uh, experiences, and so on of their transnational ties of what's going on also in the sending society. So this concept gives us enough to uh, play around and reflect with regard to these uh, political uh, actions or political sentiments that eventually do not generate all of a sudden uh, they might be related to national, uh, or in this case, cross-strait politics, but as well to migrant transnational networks. Uh, so, uh, and here I'm looking at three levels. How many minutes I had? Five minutes. <laughs> oh my God. So, um, um, I've, I'm really sorry, I did very bad with time. Um, so uh, this slide is trying to give us an idea of uh, voting behavior, actually behavior and also expectations on the side of the, the, the two party, parties. As I said, the DPP is definitely the more welcoming Southeast Asian spouses, whereas the KMT uh, mainland spouses. This is a matter of whom these marriage migrants married with, and we are thinking about the veterans in particular, but also uh, mainland spouses' connections to uh, China. Uh, to the point that eventually, as I said before, they become active in uh, Taiwanese uh, in Taiwanese politics, and this is what one spouse said, I had worked in the KMT for eight years as a volunteer. Almost this year there was some kind of election in Taiwan, and the KMT asked us for help. They are very well networked. They are potential voters, these migrants, therefore the need to reach them because they eventually can reach other people. We spend time and energy and money in going to their meetings. What is that for? It is only for them to mobilize our votes. And here there is a kind of uh, understanding or frustration towards the fact that they feel they've been used by the KMT. Eventually the KMT didn't, mention, didn't manage to make this equalization in terms of time to obtain citizenship. And this is a big frustration for cross-strait marriage migrants. So, uh, to the point that um, they moved from uh, traditional mainstream politics with the case of uh, uh, the KMT uh, to thinking about establishing their own parties, which is something quite new and interesting with regard to Taiwan. Um, and I want to simply move to this uh, slide. Uh, the three parties that have been established, uh, as you can see, in the 2000s, so political opportunities, an environment that is open to China with the KMT in power. The China Chinese Production Party was uh, established actually by the spouse who mentioned the fact her frustration with the KMT. Chinese New Resident Party and then the New Residents Republican Party. Their main aim are to promote, uh, th there are internal national aims that of uh, the uh, new residents and new immigrants, mainly spouses, but as well, they also include international uh, marriage migrants, to promote their interest, transform them into a political force, but eventually, here we are answering to your question, some of these parties, especially the first one, are in favor of cross-strait social and cultural exchange, harmony, and eventually some of them peaceful unification. Okay, so <coughs> eventually they bring this narrative within their own, um, um, their own parties in uh, Taiwan. I want to mention, yes, because this is in answer to your question, the parties they established, we should understand them not just in light of 
national politics in Taiwan or cross-strait relations. I frame them also as an answer to uh, actions on the side of Beijing. Beijing has more action uh, had more action in China between 2008 and 2016. And indeed, it started to reach also some communities, uh, significant communities within Taiwan. Marriage, mainland spouses are one of these communities, and especially their children, because this is a way to re-establish a connection between, uh, indeed, those uh, in Taiwan and those who at least have a, a clearer connection with China, the children of mainland spouses. So there's uh, a range of activities and institutions that have been developed uh, precisely to favor these uh, exchanges. And the narrative that we can read uh, in the website relate, websites related to this, uh, to the Cross-Trade Marriage and Family Service Center and also association, or the, the, the data, that the, the material that is produced out of the Cross-Trade Family Forum, uh, is uh, then uh, reused by cross-strait marriage migrants whenever they create a narrative for their parties or the narrative in uh, Taiwan. Good, I think uh, I need to stop here. Sorry. I'm really sorry. I, hope, uh, I had plenty of time in between. Uh, but I hope that I, at least I gave some ideas of what the complexity of marriage migration in Taiwan, because it is indeed a quite complex issue, precisely because of this uh, Taiwan political uh, situation. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for your questions. I really appreciated them.